All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Pritchard Committee's uh, conversation with a panel of our leaders in higher education across the state as we explore uh, what the COVID-19 crisis is doing and what impact it has on our higher education institutions and on student learning and how our, our system and the leaders in our system are responding to the needs on our campuses and the needs of our students and faculty on campuses as we move forward. Um, so as folks know, um, in the past two weeks, Kentucky's colleges and universities um, accomplished the seemingly impossible. Facing a global pandemic and following federal and state guidelines, they quickly pivoted to online instruction began moving students out of the dorms, canceled or postponed commencements, and transitioned to a remote workplace for many employees to help stop the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And it's important to note that this is completely unprecedented. While we have some experience with K-12 schools shutting down for long periods and responding to the nutritional needs of students, as well as the needs of non-traditional instruction, we have very little experience to draw on in the post-secondary environment. So while situations are still fluid, we wanted to check in with a panel of Kentucky's university and college presidents to better understand how they are responding we also want to engage the public by giving them an opportunity to ask questions of the panel as we try together to understand how to respond to this crisis, what it will mean, and how ultimately we can be innovative during this time to come through on the other side stronger than we were when the crisis hit. So I'd like to thank our guests for participating and a special thank you to President Aaron Thompson and the Council on Post-Secondary Education for partnering with us on this forum. So this afternoon we have with us Dr. Jay Box, President of Kentucky's Community and Technical College System. Jay, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Bridget. Dr. David McFadden, Interim President of Eastern Kentucky University. Welcome, David. Thank you, Bridget. Dr. Jay Morgan, president of Moorhead State University. Good afternoon, Jay. Nice to be with you, Bridget. Dr. Ashish Vaidya, president of Northern Kentucky University, my alma mater. Thank you, Dr. Vaidya, for being here. Thank you, Bridget, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. And Dr. Burton Webb, president of uh, University of Pikeville. Dr. Bur or Dr. Webb, thank you for being with us. Thanks. It's good to be here, Bridget. Great. So to those watching this discussion, if you have questions you'd like to pose to the panel, you can tweet them to me at B. Blum Ramsey or use the, uh, the Facebook comment box. To get us started, presidents, just give us a sense of your day-to-day -day, uh, work-life experience since the crisis hit a couple weeks ago. I don't see any little ones running around in the background or pets on your laps, um, but still, just give us a brief overview of your kind of your life balance right now um, and how this crisis is impacting you. Dr. Box, I'll yeah. give it to you. Thanks, Bridget. I'll, I'll uh, tell you that uh, my day is spent probably in front of, the, of this computer at home and with a cell phone to my left and an iPad to my right, monitoring uh, information coming from all different directions. Uh, Yesterday, uh, we, we had a uh, four-hour meeting with our, our college presidents across the state in, the, in our system. Uh, and doing that uh, by virtual Skype meeting or, or Zoom meeting, it's very difficult. But uh, we're trying to monitor that on all, all levels. I'm also a part of the national state directors of community colleges and all 50 of us have been exchanging best practices in our states for how we're dealing with the uh, COVID-19. So it's, it's been an interesting time. So Dr. Box, to your point, I mean, this is unprecedented nationally. So you're really joining with other presidents across the nation to figure out how we respond to this. That, that's correct. Uh, there is a, a great attempt to coordinate what each state is doing uh, related to especially online services for our students and online delivery, as most states have gone to a purely online uh, for, uh, delivery of coursework. So, Dr. Morgan, how about you? How are things in Moorhead? Uh, 
Bridget, things in Moorhead are, are very well. It's a beautiful day on our campus today. Uh, all the trees are blooming out in the quad. All the, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, all the trees are blooming out in the quad, but no one's here to enjoy it, really. We have probably 80% uh, of all of our employees and our workforce off campus at current. Uh, most of our residence halls are emptying out earlier this week, and we should be complete with that. Probably by tomorrow, we still do have a couple of students around who are international base and students who uh, live uh, a great deal away from here and can't make expedited trips back home very often. So we're in the process this week of accommodating those folks. And our focus really this week has been on trying to get our students situated in not only online instruction, but also in our residence hall. We have thousands of students that live on our campus and it was quite, a, quite an operation to get them moved out over the past six to eight days. But uh, our campus is adapting well and we're learning Zoom very well, so. And your family, Dr. Morgan? How's Doing very going? well, thank you. They are locked up at home and I um, think they're able to get out a little bit with this nice weather, but I know they're missing school as well. Yeah, hashtag healthy at home, right? Yeah. Yep. Dr. Vijaya, how about you in Northern Kentucky? How's how's life? Yeah, yes, indeed. Well, this would have been the week um, uh, we had extended our spring break by an extra week, and this would have been the week for our students to come back. And um, I, I think, as, as Jay said, you know, the biggest challenge, I think, in one way is not having the vibrancy uh, on the campus, especially with students and seeing them and welcoming them back and hoping that they are ready for the second half of the semester. So we obviously, like, like everybody else, had to make the tough decision to extend spring break and, and switch to the alternative instruction, the online instruction. Uh, I will have to say, uh, I think probably uh, my colleagues will, will join me in agreeing, uh, our, our community, our campus community has stepped up such, in such remarkable ways, in such a short period of time to pivot. The faculty, the staff, everyone has gone above and beyond to accommodate and continue to serve students the best way we can. As you said, Bridget, unprecedented challenge and crisis, but um, the patience, resilience um, has been very impressive to watch and it gives me a lot of comfort uh, in doing that. My day-to-day my -day balance is very different. I don't get my 10,000 steps that easily. <laughs> I used to, I would be so easy to walk from one meeting to the other or, or just go around campus and uh, get into the car and go somewhere. And now I'm finding, as Jay mentioned, uh, spending such long hours in front of <laughs> the laptop that it's a bit of a challenge. We have a check-in every morning with the cabinet. Uh, it's still a very tactical uh, approach and uh, I'm glad we'll talk a little bit more later on moving from the tactical to the strategic. I've already started alerting our people that uh, we have to start thinking about what's, what does the other side look like and how are we prepared to do that. Uh, NKU has always been very nimble and flexible in its thinking as as uh, uh, one of the young ones around the table. And so I hope we take uh, advantage of some of that uh, to find new ways to, to make sure our value proposition is clear. Absolutely, Dr. Vijan. We certainly join you in that effort to really see around the corner um, and, and let what's around the corner help us design what we need to today in the midst of this crisis. Um, Dr. Webb, how about things in deep eastern Kentucky? How are you faring, you and your family? Oh, the mountains are beautiful out here in eastern Kentucky. I think that uh, we're doing quite well as an institution. Uh, we were able to pivot pretty quickly into an online teaching modality. Uh, we were fortunate in that about two years ago, we shifted uh, to a different learning management system and had already trained 75% of our faculty in how to teach a full course online. So the pivot for us was a, a lot less steep than at a lot of institutions. Uh, probably the biggest challenge is finding placements for our medical students. Uh, the medical students, of course, who are on clinical rotations in their third and fourth years, uh, they've had some challenges because a lot of the hospitals have said we don't want students right now. Uh, of course, that switched a couple of days ago when Governor Bashir announced that he wanted medical students to volunteer. And and a large number of our medical students have volunteered and they're now participating back again, many of them in the same hospitals, uh, doing a lot of the same kinds of things that they were doing before. So uh, that pivot has, has taken place and turned back. 
but I would say that the overall health of the institution here in Eastern Kentucky is, is doing quite well. Uh, I think we represent the only private institution in this panel. You do. Uh, you know, so we're maybe a little different voice perhaps out here in the far Eastern corner of the state. And thank you for being with us. Dr. McFadden, how about things at Eastern Kentucky University and for, for you personally? Well, we are, uh, we are moving forward, uh, much like Dr. Webb, uh, about a third of our student population was already 100% online. So this transition, while it was, uh, while we've not moved to what I would, would say is a traditional online instructional format, and, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of instructional design that goes into to the online space. We have moved to remote learning and uh, our faculty have, have done yeoman's work to step up and do, do the work that needs to be done to support our students. This is our first week of instruction, so we're through week one. Uh, it has been amazingly quiet. Uh, our, our students have adapted well, our faculty are providing amazing resources. Uh, we've, we've created a, an entire virtual uh, platform for students to get advising for them to work with our mental health professionals on campus. Uh, so uh, while these are definitely unprecedented times, we, we are eager for the days moving forward. And as Dr. Vadia highlighted, I think that thinking about what's next is, is the big thing for us. As we think about what's on the other side of this spring semester, what, what is the, the federal uh, stimulus? Uh, what do we see in that in, in the, the, the CARES bill? Uh, what the, the General Assembly in Kentucky is going to do is going to have some big impacts on the public institutions in Kentucky. Absolutely. We're all anxiously awaiting, and I know we have some information regarding the federal stimulus, and we'll get into that a little bit later in our discussion. Mm -hmm. And we're all, of course, anxiously awaiting what the General Assembly will do with the final budget. Um, so we were pleased to see that the House and the Senate uh, put in some significant new revenue for higher education, but with a new consensus uh, forecasting group uh, revenue estimate or the, uh, the, the most negative one maybe now in use. Uh, I think we're all a little bit worried about what that general budget might budget will will hold for post secondary. So just thinking about students now, as as you had to have to had to give this news to students and faculty um, to let them know that things were going to change on a dime. Um, we're really in a new normal, no matter how long it lasts. We're in a new normal at this point in time. So how did you, what, what guidelines or kind of how did you, how did you communicate this to students in a way that you felt was most helpful for them in such uncertainty and to faculty as well? And um, how are you feeling about, about all of that? We'll just let anybody jump in. Well, Bridget, I'll, I'll just start off. I know my, my colleagues will have a lot to add as well. Um, you know, I think, I, I think with our students, uh, as we were sort of in the middle of spring break when all this was uh, really unfolding as rapidly as possible. So in a way, uh, it helped a little bit in terms of timing. Uh, we knew that they weren't expecting a great deal of, of information or engagement from the university. Um, and, um, and, you know, it, it, it allowed us to kind of just take a quick 24 to 48 hour stock of what we were going to do and prepare our messaging for the students. And um, uh, as soon as we made some early decisions, we wanted to start putting it out there. Uh, and fortunately, as you know, we were given our location. We have to pay attention to not only what's happening in Frankfurt and the governor, uh, public health officials here, but also in the state of Ohio. 23% uh, of our students are from Ohio. And so uh, we were mindful of, and, and many of our faculty and staff uh, live across the river. So we wanted to mi be mindful of the fact that we had to get information out that was both consistent with the information we were receiving from both Ohio as well as Kentucky uh, and get that out. So uh, multiple venues, obviously email, which we know that students don't always look at, pointing them to social media, saying here's an update that's going on. And then, of course, making sure that our, our, uh, the entire university community is checking in with them uh, and slowly adapting to the, the new virtual environment to get the messages and video things out there. I put my first one out and probably going to be doing a few more uh, as we move forward and find new ways to engage with our students. So what have been the challenges that you've experienced, as I know you all have communicated, <clears throat> the need for students and faculty to go to an online learning environment? So that means many faculty have had to quickly learn how to utilize that environment for instruction. Um, some were already there, but some are more traditional uh, um, uh, teacher learner spaces. 
um, and students as well. Uh, many are familiar with online learning environments, but there again, it's still kind of a learning curve for a lot of folks. So what have been the, I guess, the, the challenges and what are the successes, maybe the bright spots you're beginning to see as we transition to this wholly online learning space to wrap up the semester? Bridget, I'll, I'll jump in if my colleagues will permit. Uh, our faculty have done quite well in this turn, in this abrupt transition. Luckily, we had spring break on our side, so we had a little bit of lead planning, and many of uh, my colleagues uh, on the feed today, as well as across the state, probably had differing spring breaks. Some probably fell to their advantage, and some probably were challenging. Ours happened to be to our advantage. We took a lot of our spring break last week in order to uh, use that time to bring some of our faculty up to speed. Our faculty who were not already online, and our, our campus was already about 30 to 35% online, much like uh, EKU and Dr. McFadden mentioned a couple of moments ago. So our turn was not quite as steep as it could have been, but our faculty stepped up last week and also this week, and many of them who were not formally engaged uh, deeply in online instruction were aided by individuals at Word. So we saw, we saw a lot of people huddling in offices, converting material. Some of our more proficient faculty stepped in and provided a, a lot of knowledge across the board to, to make this turn. I will say that the one difficulty that, that we're still working through, and there are still several to go, is meeting the challenges of laboratories. Uh, laboratories, one-on-one -on -one instruction, such as music, chemistry, art, and there are others as well. But I, I think our folks are starting to get very creative and learning a lot of new online, online modalities. I think that will challenge us for the remainder of the spring semester on how to deliver adequate laboratory, one-on-one, -on -one, and other clinical environments. So we'll continue to have to work on that. and. Uh, I no think doubt. we'll get to where we need to be. Sure. So any any bright spots from others across the state as you think about, in particular, those learning environments where the the face-to-face -face and the maybe the in-person collaboration is necessary, like lab uh, classes and arts classes? Yeah, for KCTCS, that, that's, that's, that's probably been our biggest challenge is our technical programs. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as being able to uh, teach online, 65% uh, of our students take at least one online class. So the majority of our faculty are prepared to teach online, but that doesn't necessarily help us be able to deal with the hands-on assessments that are necessary, training and assessments in our technical programs. And that's caused us uh, quite a bit of, of scheduling problems uh, we're pushing all of our technical program face-to-face uh, -face environment as laid out as we can, late in the semester as we can. Hoping, to, Dr. Box, hoping that students will be able to get back on campus before the end of the semester. Right, and if it goes beyond the end of the semester, uh, we're looking at uh, trying to push it into uh, to the early part of the summer. So as uh, staying kind of in the vein of student supports and learning absolutely paramount, we wanna make sure the learning continues and that students wrap up their semester strong and they're positioned for strong entrance back into school either later this summer or in the fall. Um, but those basic needs I think have become important for our college students in a way that our system has never really had to think about. So how are, you, how are you responding to like the question about housing needs, food insecurities for students who expected to be on campus with a meal plan right now? How, how are our universities responding to some of those basic needs knowing students um, are being displaced? You know, Bridget, I mean, Frankly, we, yeah. we've stayed open for, for those very students. You know, we have a certain percentage of students who we know come from places where they have food insecurity or housing insecurity and we talked to our city leaders and our local health officials and they said, you know, they've got to be housed and they've got to be fed. So we're still open for those students. It's a smaller subset of the total student body, uh, but we're still meeting the needs of those students. And we have the additional difficulty, as I know a couple of my colleagues do, 
uh, of not really good internet access out in the hills and hollers of Eastern Kentucky. And so we have quite a few students who drive onto campus and either distance themselves in our library or some of our other facilities, or some of them just sit in the parking lot where they can get really good high speed internet and they can participate in class. Wow. So we're meeting those needs by staying open and, and continuing to meet those needs. Yeah, Dr. McFadden? Yeah, Bridget, likewise, we're open for those students who have a hardship or, or don't have some place to go. And, you know, through this process, you, you learn things about your student body that you knew, but uh, there, there's truly some, um, some students who are, who are putting everything they have into this education. And uh, this education is what's gonna build a pathway forward for them. Uh, we are open for those students. We're providing dining services, but we've also launched the, what we're calling our SAFE initiative, which is a student assistance fund. And uh, we've had about 100 requests for students, student assistance for students who have went back to their home. Uh, we launched that uh, initiative two days ago. Uh, we've raised almost $20,000 to support those students and, and bringing uh, opportunity to them wherever they're at, whether they're on campus or whether they're they're at their permanent residence. But uh, our campus is large enough. We have enough housing options to really uh, have good, have good uh, social distancing, good hygiene, and be able to serve those students who need to be here. Uh, but I also commend uh, the others on this on this call. Every one of us have opened our campus up to to where if students are in proximity to one of, of our locations, and particularly Dr. Box uh, across the the Commonwealth, the KCTCS footprint is is very impactful. The ability for our students to go to one of their venues to, to do online learning or, or remote assistance has really been a huge help. So we so have Bridget, a much like uh, much like my colleagues, we're, it's very much similar to the same situation. The food and security, you know, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, we're very proud of our Fuel and KU food pantry, which uh, which is in collaboration with Kroger. And uh, the folks there were very insistent that they will continue to keep that open at least three days a week limited hours, they will have only one person there at a time. They will have to go pack so that the students can come. We saw a sudden spike in, in, um, in usage there, of course, uh, um, and, and something we didn't want to, we didn't want to change. Uh, David mentioned the uh, fund there. We have a similar uh, student emergency fund. Uh, we, but it's been open about a week. Uh, again, the generosity of both the campus, our alumni donors was tremendous. And we've seen uh, over 160 applications already for that funds, uh, for those funds, and uh, we're trying to process them as, as quickly as we can, and uh, keeping an eye out on what the federal stimulus will be able to provide in additional support for our students. I think each one of us serves the kinds of students that uh, are most vulnerable in many cases, um, first generation, yes, low income, and so uh, I think our needs are very specific, uh, and we and we hope that we will be able to uh, find some additional resources. Uh, to be able to keep keep them on their educational journey. Yes, absolutely, an excellent point. And we, we need to remember that, um, you know, Kentucky as a state, we still linger near the bottom of the nation when it comes to poverty. So many of our students now accessing uh, post-secondary education. Our, our first gen are from low-income households and some of these these issues are big issues in Kentucky. So we are getting a, a few questions on our on the Facebook page and coming in through other avenues. A question posed on the Facebook page and by a Kentucky College student, Gabriella um, Stakova, ask about uh, pass fail uh, for to wrap up the semester. And if any of you um, have made a decision about pass fail grades to wrap up the semester, or if you're staying the course um, with the regular grade system at this point. Bridget, I'll, I'll chime in just very quickly for the viewing audience. Uh, we announced yesterday, actually yesterday and again today to our students, uh, a very broad and liberal pass-fail policy for courses that were uh, not only abruptly transitioned on March 23rd for our campus from face-to-face -to, -face to online, but broader than that across our academic spectrum to all courses this spring. And the reason we did that is because not only did students have to abruptly change on March 23rd from face-to-face -to, -face to online in many cases, but many of them were displaced in housing. Some were displaced in jobs that they held in our community. While we kept many of our students on campus uh, doing uh, projects that were federal work study and institutional work study, they are working remotely and not on our campus. So their lives were disrupted and we felt like we needed to be very, very broad 
uh, in allowing students to make that choice. They have to make that choice by May the 1st in conjunction with their faculty member, the instructor. There are a couple of areas that we are watching very closely, particularly around certification where specific grades are required, dual credit courses that feed back into the high school uh, environment for high school graduation, and then also for anyone who is maybe pre-professional or otherwise. So there are some cases where we think students will trend very heavily or have to trend very heavily toward a letter grade, but we do have a very liberal pass-fail policy for this spring only. Dr. Morgan, you mentioned a federal work study. So, um, and that was a question that actually came up in our first Facebook Live event now about two weeks ago uh, with President Thompson um, on the line. And the question was posed about federal work study to keep, some, keep students employed. Um, yeah. And so can you just expand on that a little bit more from Moorhead State University? Sure, at Moorhead State University, we have about 1,100 total student workers on campus. A little bit over 500 of those were federal work study. And we guaranteed all federal work study students employment all the way to the end of the spring semester, because oftentimes that is uh, wound up in their financial aid packaging. And that's a consideration that we wanted to make for that uh, particular segment of students. Now I mentioned we have a total of about 1100 student workers. The other 600 or so that were not federal work study students, we are continuing many of them as well. Uh, they are working uh, almost exclusively remotely. We do have a couple that are doing some core work for us here, but they're very spread out. Our federal work study students will go all the way to the end of the spring semester and in some of our other institutional work studies well as well. But we tried to safeguard particularly the students uh, who have financial needs. So uh, pivoting a little bit, but still uh, discussing students, your response to international students on campus, um, are, are they some of the students who are staying in the dorms that you're providing food for? Are they uh, moving off campus, going back home? What does that look like? You know, Bridget, it's, it's a mix on our campus. Uh, a lot of our international students have already um, headed home and, and we've assisted them with, with that uh, departure from campus to their home. Um, you know, there were obviously a lot of moving parts and kind of the, the geopolitical status of travel. Uh, so we, we assisted our students in doing that. We do have uh, a handful of students still on campus who, who represent our international student population. Uh, some of those are students here who are on um, athletic scholarships. Some, some may be here uh, otherwise uh, doing, doing their studies, but we've worked with them and we're, we're in constant contact with them and, and we're making sure that they're able to connect with their virtual learning experience uh, just like our students who are right here in, uh, you know, this community or, or in Eastern Kentucky or, or, or really anywhere we serve. Okay, David raises a really good point because a lot of those students already had their home countries uh, close their borders. So we had the same thing. We had several students who really couldn't go home. They were stuck here. And so that's one of the reasons that we, we maintain that open dorm policy. I see. Okay. And, um, Dr. Webb, to you, the question about the internet. Um, so we have a question from a high school student here in Lexington, Sana Calhoun, who asked about internet and digital devices. Um, and of course, we're seeing you know, a lot of that discussion is happening in the K-12 environment. So many of our kids, even for non-traditional instruction, either don't have good internet, or if they do, they don't have the proper devices to really access that online learning opportunity. Um, you mentioned students sitting in the parking lot to access, uh, I guess, the Wi-Fi on campus. Mm -hmm. What else maybe have you discussed or how are you responding to those needs that so many of us take for granted? Well, we've, we've actually got a variety of approaches to that depending on the needs of the students. Uh, we've had a few students who had access to internet but didn't have good laptops. Uh, and so we are fortunate enough that we've had several uh, laptop carts on campus that have been used in laboratory settings. We've disassembled some of those and we've been sharing those laptops with students who desperately need them. Uh, so we've been able to do that. They're loaners and they'll get them back to us at some point in the future. Uh, so that's one approach that we've taken. Uh, there are a couple of others, you know, related to internet and the usability of internet. Um, we've, we've been able to reach out to some of our students to provide that or to give them locations where they can go 
uh, to access internet. Certainly, Jay, you know, we've already mentioned Jay Box and some of the things that are happening there. A lot of our students are close to a community college and they know that there's access on those community college campuses. So that's been very helpful as well. And then just today I heard in our local chamber of commerce meeting that Appalachian Wireless, which is our local um, cellular service out here, they have most of the towers in Eastern Kentucky and they're putting hotspots in a lot of community centers in the very small, very remote towns so that our K through 12 population and our college students can have access uh, even if it is, again, sitting in a parked car to maintain that physical distancing uh, from everyone who's around them, they're still able to find that kind of access. Sounds kind of like an old fashioned drive through. More like a drive in. Dri drive in, yes. <laughs> yes, an old fashioned drive in, right? Um, but yes. for learning, yeah, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Okay, and then um, Dr. Vijay, you mentioned Kroger as a real partner in uh, food insecurity. And I'm wondering if any of you are hearing about private partners who are um, maybe thinking, how, thinking about how they can help students with the devices they need uh, to continue their learning. Yeah, I mean, we you know, uh, uh, we also recognize as my colleagues do that we're also a major partner and an anchor institution for the region. Uh, and so we've made sure that we are collaborating in multiple ways with other partners in this region to serve uh, not just students, but also the small businesses that are, that are surrounding our communities and are also badly affected in many ways. Uh, and so this has really become a, a, a way to, to enhance uh, this region's thinking about what we need to do to come together to serve. So I'll just give you one small example uh, about how the, uh, Triad, which is the Economic Development Agency here, along with the Northern Kentucky Chamber, the Regional Alliance and NKU have come together to help small businesses apply for these loans that are being, uh, being provided. Uh, they've been inundated with requests. And, and as we know, small business is the engine of economic prosperity uh, and driver of economic development for us. Uh, our region is no different. So we're making sure we, we, uh, we find ways in which we do this. Um, you mentioned IT, our capacity to expand uh, Zoom teleconferencing and other things. Again, we reached out to our folks uh, who are vendors, our partners, uh, whether it's our dining services, our, our, our other partners on the campus, and they've all been really magnanimous in their support and finding ways in which we could continue our core mission in a way that's meaningful. So uh, again, I'm, I'm just blown away uh, and so impressed by folks saying, you know, this is a this is a challenge that affects each and every one of us in some way or the other. How can we find a way to come together and make this better? Yeah, and if, if we want to close those attainment gaps that we know exist, um, those students that, that stop out for some reason along the way, this is a moment in time that we want to ensure those protections are there for students. So this isn't a, a, a reason for kind of stopping out of post-secondary at this moment in time. But it's actually a moment in time where we're infusing so many supports that uh, it helps us all, I guess, get over the hump, so to speak. Um, I want to pivot to uh, thinking about the fall and uh, uh, get just somewhat around the corner, not quite into the future, but certainly into the fall. And uh, wondering how you all are thinking about admission, admissions and recruitment. Dr. Vaidya, a specific question from Cincinnati Public Radio. Um, Ambril Crutchfield, who wants to know how NKU is thinking about recruitment for the fall, um, and kind of rolled into that question. We know there are students across the nation who are calling for uh, test optional admissions. So I want to open that up for you, and Dr. Vijay, I'll go, I'll go to you first. Um, because sure. Happy, happy to do that, Bridget. In, in particular, I think I um, want to mention to our listeners in Cincinnati Public Radio and, and across the region, We've already made some adjustments. We've extended admission deadlines, scholarship deadlines, so that we're trying to be as flexible as possible. You mentioned test optional. It was something we were considering anyway as part of our uh, strategic framework on success by design, which is how can we improve access? It's uh, you know now, I think, a national best practice that test scores by themselves are really poor indicators of success in college. And so for those students who have not been able to take any tests, we are in fact switching to test optional admission for them for this fall. And perhaps that might be something we will initiate even in a larger scale uh, going forward. Uh, so we've made those adjustments. Our uh, enrollment management folks have really been hard at work to make sure we don't, we try and not skip a beat with respect to recruitment for the fall. And we've switched 
all the on-campus visits to a virtual tour. Um, we've had actually some very good success with students who've been able to come in and schedule a visit and they actually get a chance to do a virtual tour. Uh, I've taken the liberty, I think I can do that, my colleagues will hopefully support me on that, to volunteer each and every member of the leadership team on NKU, including our coaches, to say, hey, you'll be called upon to give a welcome to our newly admitted students and recruits. You guys do that anyway, so we'll have our coach, uh, coaches in, uh, in basketball and volleyball and every other field to say, hey, we're going to be part of this team to, to join in and help our students feel welcome and know that NKU is going to be here, it continues to be here, uh, and finding unique ways to make sure our students feel connected to this school. How about others? Are you talking about test optional? What are you thinking about recruiting for the fall? You know, Bridget, as, as we've thought about, uh, you know, some of the other indicators prior to the COVID-19 uh, issue, uh, you know, there were, there were some, some downward pressure on, uh, on what would have been the traditional um, senior, 18-year-old, uh, 18, 18 to 24-year-old en enrollment population. So uh, I think we're being very innovative, and, and Dr. Vaidia highlighted a few of those things, test optional, uh, extending the, the scholarship deadlines, extending the application deadlines, moving to virtual orientations, virtual tours, uh, having some intimate advising with students. And, and frankly, we're seeing a lot of uptick and in interest in, in students uh, being able to have that type of experience. So, um, you know, as we're thinking about what the fall looks like, it's going to look different than any fall we've ever seen before. Uh, we don't know what the ultimate uh, change in consumer behavior will be, uh, as we've seen a 100% uh, online or virtual remote learning experience. Uh, we know there's still a place for a residential college experience. We know there's still... Uh, there is transformational things that happen uh, as you, you think about your college experience. But we also understand we've got to be responsive uh, to, to the marketplace and what, the, what, what our students need and what they want. And, uh, and so we're, we stand ready to, to meet them where they are. And, and I think that uh, each of us will, will adapt and, and move in that direction to, to be the best version of the institution we can be. I'll chime in here also from KCTCS. Of course, we're open access, so we didn't have to worry about the admissions issues that the other institutions did. But I think what's concerned us about the, the fall semester is uh, sort of what Dr. McFadden was speaking about, and that is, what are the students going to want coming back out of this totally online environment? Um, we, we believe that... Um, there will be much more acceptance and much more demand probably for our online programs, but we've got to be innovative with how we deal with those students who do want the face-to-face -face environment and still need to be working. And we've been spending quite a bit of money on developing innovative ways to deliver face-to-face -face programming. And in some cases, they're in hybrid formats where, where the students can come one day a week or one night a week uh, for their classwork and then be online for, for the rest of it. And we think that's going to be a big challenge for us is to how to provide the access to coursework uh, in a face-to-face -face environment when most of our students are going to be working at least part-time and maybe full-time just to recoup from the economy. Bridget, I'll, I'd like to just add from Moorhead State standpoint that uh, and I think Dr. Box brought up a, a very good term there, and I almost want to call it a hybrid model, where many students will, will want that online environment, but they still may also, in the same course, want some type of face-to-face -face interaction. So I could see Moorhead State trending more toward a, a hybrid for many of our sections. Some will continue to be uh, continuously online, 100%. But I think a hybrid model going forth uh, could, could be a very attractive model for many. Indeed, an innovation for sure. Um, so this question in our, on our Facebook page from E.M. Rausch directed to you, Dr. Morgan, specifically, but I think is relevant for the entire group. And um, it's about what types of programs, um, as students are thinking about what types of programs they might enter, um, are you thinking um, about uh, like the healthcare industry differently because of this crisis and what's needed in our programs to support the healthcare industry, direct service as well as others? Sure. Um, 
and what does that mean for, for the fall and how we might be advising students in this moment in our capacity to uh, deliver, I guess, the human capital in that space? Well, visioning forward, uh, that's going to be probably an ongoing discussion, not only among uh, the healthcare industry, but also providers of students for the industry, like all of us uh, taking part uh, in today's conversation. You know, from a from a broad perspective, and our university has a lot of STEM plus H programs. We provide nurses for the region and uh, outside the region. We provide a lot of individuals for pre-professional programs, particularly in medical and health sciences. I think there will be some very broad changes in how we prepare our students going forward based off this experience. Uh, by example, uh, we're seeing uh, swings toward telemedicine where a, an individual or provider on the other end of the telephone has to be able to advise uh, an individual or a patient probably a little differently than maybe they did in, in the past of meeting that individual face-to-face physically examining that individual and so forth. So I think from a preparation standpoint, all of us across the state and probably across the nation will be looking at how we maybe modify some of that pre-professional training. We still remain committed at Moorhead State for uh, putting professionals out in the region, uh, particularly nurses and individuals in imaging sciences and other clinical areas. But I do think it's gonna look a little different going forward. It may not immediately in the fall semester, but as curriculum molds and adapts, I could see it moving very quickly to meet some of the experiences that all of us have had over the past couple of weeks. Any other thoughts as you, I know University of Pikeville, Northern Kentucky University, you know, the, the health support services and education, you having specific conversations there? Well, of course, because, you know, the health healthcare profession is such a huge part of what we do. Uh, we accept students from all of the other universities that are represented here today into many of our programs, uh, including both medicine and optometry. So we have made a pretty significant pivot in that direction uh, in anticipation of, of something like this that might happen one day. Uh, and so we're, we're well prepared for that. We've been growing our nursing programs year over year and a variety of other para-health programs that we're now exploring and working our way into, along with our partners at PMC. Uh, we're also pretty heavily leveraged at this point in moving toward a direction of biomedical research. You know, the medical school gives us the opportunity to do that, and we are fortunate or unfortunate, depending on your perspective, to sit in a part of the state that has a lot of endemic health needs. And so we have the opportunity to, to do some groundbreaking research in that area so that we can move the conversation forward about how we solve these health disparities. So I think that that's gonna be a significant portion of what we do in the coming years as we begin, we begin to think strategically about the next several years. Bridget, I, I will just add, I think uh, certainly um, uh, you probably are aware, but one of the good things that NKU has done uh, over its, in its young history has been very strategic about focusing on a few areas of distinctive importance. And we have done that largely by drawing upon what the region really needs. Uh, so informatics, which has now become one of our clearly uh, uh, areas of emphasis and, and uh, one that the region relies very much on to produce the kinds of people that they need uh, in data science, cybersecurity, computer science, communication. Um, and of course, so that's, that's something that we will continue to focus on. But health has become another area that is critical with, uh, with our new health innovation center that was recently uh, launched, uh, and of course, our partnership with St. Elizabeth Healthcare, as well as UK for the College of Medicine. So uh, that, and as my colleague said, the field will be evolving, you know, whether it's telemedicine, whether it's social determinants of health, whether it's how do we build immu com immunity among communities, how do the disparities of health affect different populations? There are such uh, intricate areas that we have to now start moving in. The third area that we've already built capacity and will continue to build is in global supply chain and logistics, obviously because of the airport being closed by, uh, the, the recent announcement of Amazon Prime being making this their global headquarters. So we are positioning our program portfolio to think about what the needs of the region are. So these are the, the high demand fields uh, broadly defined that our students will want and the region will want. 
Um, I don't think that emphasis uh, needs to change in the post COVID-19 world. It just means maybe some fine tuning and thinking about new opportunities that we have to think about uh, as, as both um, a region, but a, a commonwealth as well as the nation about how do we think about some of these larger issues. I think there are some fascinating questions that we have to be asking ourselves. What did we learn from this pandemic um, in a way that changes the future of work uh, for, for our society? And uh, I still believe that uh, our institutions in particular uh, play a vital role in, in addressing that particular question. Yeah, Bridget, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hop in there, Bridget, on one other issue there. And you know, for our institution, uh, nursing is a huge program for us. We're 1,400 uh, students in our nursing program, occupational therapy. But one area that we're really proud of is, is mental health. And as we think about the overall physical well-being of someone, what we found was social distancing with this, uh, with the change in, in format of delivery. There's a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt out there. And so, uh, as we've seen our, our mental health services services uh, as individuals are coping with this, uh, our PsyD program, uh, our doctorate in psychology. Uh, we've seen a major uptick there and we've got professionals going out to work in that space. Uh, I just think that's going to be a very important part of the recovery from uh, this pandemic will be the mental health of not only our campuses, but our communities in the world uh, on whole. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Thank you for um, getting that in there, David. Richard, Richard I also have one other comment. I think we're going to have a challenge with all of our institutions and that is in hiring enough faculty to meet the demands, especially in our health careers and nursing programs. We're tr trying to expand these across the state, and yet we'll be in competition with the expanded need for employment in, in our hospitals and other uh, health care facilities. Uh, and so that's going to require much more uh, effort on our, our side in partnering with the uh, health care providers and maybe sharing uh, nurses, nurse instructors, and other uh, instructors, so uh, that we can expand the programs to meet their needs. Uh, okay, so enrich partnerships as we move forward, in addition to kind of thinking about hybrid delivery. Thank you, Dr. Box. So I'm going to, we just have a few minutes remaining, and uh, we are committed to, um, to, to stopping our Facebook Live events in time for folks across the state to hop on to Governor Bashir's Facebook Live events each evening um, at five o'clock. So we'll hold fast to the time. But I do want to pivot to kind of the, the state of higher education and the critical issue of funding for higher education. Um, you know, everything we're talking about right now kind of hinges on the need to uh, uh, to skill folks up and to ensure that our um, education attainment increases, but at a time when we're looking at likely a significant downturn in our economy. Um, Kentucky is one of a few states that has yet begun to reinvest in higher education following more than a decade of cuts in state funding. In fact, our longest border state of Tennessee has reinvested by double digits at a time when Kentucky was still cutting. Um, and yet we've been doing a lot of work as a state to increase our college attainment rate to meet the national average at least. And I know we hope that we'll surpass that national average. It's critical for our growth as an economy. It's critical for the stabilization of individuals and families. Um, but all the while campuses are already operating on the margins and struggling with operating pressures uh, before COVID, but now probably in addition to uh, COVID-19 and a likely global recession. So share your thoughts, I guess, on um, the, the challenges that post-secondary is going to face meeting the needs of the economy, the needs of our communities um, in, a, in, a, in a time when uh, we may not have the additional investment that we need. And please feel free, free to bring in the pension issue into your response as well, because that's an additional um, structural pressure on the system. Um, and I think it's so important for folks to understand the pressure our post-secondary system is under um, and what that means for our economy going forward. We've got to break the log jam. Bridget, I may start off and then I'll let uh, my colleagues jump in and uh, add some context. I think the most important thing you said and that is investment. And I think we have to understand that higher education is an investment in this state and one 
that will pay dividends uh, if we invest in it. As we look at the immense amount of unemployment claims that are going to be made over the coming weeks and months, uh, what we will see, I, I believe, and, and studies in the past have proven this out, is that those with, with some credential, uh, a post-secondary credential, whether it be an associate's degree, uh, a certificate, a bachelor's, a graduate degree, we will see that those individuals will be insulated uh, from this downturn in the economy. Uh, what we will see is that if we educate more members of our state and bring knowledge workers to this state, we will have a more diversified economy that will be more, it will be more resistant to these types of, these types of downturns. This is a global impact, there's no doubt about it. Uh, but if we do not start to invest in higher ed uh, in this state, if we do not solve this pension crisis, uh, it is going to be something that will have generational uh, impacts that will not be positive for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. As a native son of this state, as a first generation college student myself, giving that opportunity to, to our students to recruit students here from out of state to, to invest in our own is the single best investment we can make. When we think about the panacea of all the things that trouble us as a nation, as a, as a state, I truly believe that, that education is the one thing that, that can really address this. Couldn't agree with you more, Dr. McFadden. I, I would just add, I think my colleague was very eloquent, David was, uh, and I, uh, you know, his point was a, is a very important one in this time to be reinforced. Um, higher education not only is an engine of economic mobility, but it also is one that protects downward mobility. Uh, so that as we think about why this is a wise investment, it's not just when times are good, but when things are problematic, that the investment in, in higher education helps uh, do this. In fact, we don't have to look that far back. The 2000, 2008 Great Recession, um, and as David pointed out, those with post-secondary credentials uh, did so much significantly better in terms of both uh, workforce, job loss, reemployment, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, our mission is a steward of place, and so we are tied inextricably with the needs of our region. Uh, and and the and the sooner we start thinking more in terms of the interdependence of how public educations add value to both economic and social mobility and to vibrancy of communities, no matter what that uh, that uh, that environment looks like, the better off we'll be. And so I, I join my colleagues in saying uh, that we need this investment. And I want to give a shout out to you, Bridget, and your work in the Pritchard Committee for 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 really amplifying that voice because we do need that consistent narrative that talks about why the investment pays off dividends and the evidence certainly prevents that so uh happy to uh, to lend my voice to what my colleagues are adding here Bridget I'll, I'll chime in real quick I, I I can't agree more with my prior two colleagues I, I think they uh, said it very eloquently but I'll also add that uh, investment in higher education is uh, going to need to come from multiple avenues. Some of us have local investments, some of us do not, but we're going to need more state investment, particularly around pension cost mitigation. All of us across the screen here who live in the public domain for higher education are experiencing crushing pension costs, sometimes uh, projected to be almost a dollar on top of a dollar. So somehow I hope our state legislature and policy leaders can find some uh, solutions there. But I also want to point to the federal level as well. I hope that through this process, and it will probably be a one, two, maybe even longer process uh, in number of years, that reinvestment in higher education, either through directly to the student with um, uh, additional supports to the student, maybe the $6,000 level for Pell uh, maximization is raised some, but also maybe direct appropriations to institutions also, particularly in states like ours across the board that uh, could use a little extra help. So I'm hopeful that the investment is not only an investment, but a reinvestment by many who have gone by the wayside. I'd be remiss if I didn't jump in because I'm the one guy from a private institution here. Uh, we're a little bit odd in that we're an open admission private institution. We're very tuition dependent. Uh, we don't get federal or we, we don't get state money from the Commonwealth uh, other than the aid that travels with the students. So as Jay mentioned just a second ago, I'm a big advocate 
of funding going with the students. Students need to have choices about where they want to pursue their higher education opportunities. And we all have great options. Every person at this, at this event today uh, provides a really high quality education. And I think students need the opportunity to choose that. Uh, we've been very fortunate over the years and that we've been able to maintain very close controls on the costs that we have. And for 10 years, we have been able to offer to any Commonwealth resident the ability to come to college tuition free. And that's, that's a really strong thing. If you qualify for all the state aid and the full Pell, uh, we waive the rest of tuition. We've done that for a long time. So it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. And I think we all have business models that can get very close to that uh, if we take a really hard look at what we're doing. So thank you for this opportunity, Bridget. I know we're running out of time and I'll close it off with that. Thank you all. Thank you all for those comments. Um, you know, before the, this crisis hit, about a month before I attended the University of Kentucky's uh, Gatton School's Economic Forecast Conference. Um, and the forecast for the nation at that point in time, again, pre-coronavirus, was a growth in our national economy of 2.2%. The forecast for Kentucky in the same year, again, before corona, was 0.8%. So a huge gap in Kentucky's ability to grow our economy and the nation. And the answer to that gap, the response to why that gap exists was simple and unequivocally, was, was unequivocal. And that was low educational attainment. So if Kentucky's going to increase, if we're gonna increase the strength of our economy, grow our economy, grow our communities and stabilize uh, life in our state, um, higher education has to be our next big play. Um, and so we're, we're with you all in um, higher education being a huge part of the puzzle for Kentucky to climb the national rankings from fifth of the fifth from the bottom of the nation in poverty um, uh, to, to much higher uh, quality of life and stabilization in our economy. So I want to thank you all for what you're doing day in and day out to ensure that our students um, on our campuses now kind of uh, displaced from our campuses have all the supports that they need to finish the semester strong and to stay on track to finish um, not only the semester, but to stay on track to their degree, um, which will serve us all well in addition to them. And we wish each of you well as you weather this environment um, and encourage you. We want to work with you in that innovative thinking that serves us well as we think around the corner and into the future. We'll send you uh, comments that we've received on the Facebook page in case there are additional questions or thoughts there that would be helpful to you um, and look forward to keeping the conversation going. Thank you, each of you, for what you're doing. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Bridget. Okay, bye-bye.